All right. Hello. Welcome to the weekend live stream. Um, today, we're going to tie the candle maker from Francis Francis. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned in the last week, uh, the candle maker is the third of the um, what I like to call the nursery rhyme trio. So there's the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Um, yeah, so we finished the butcher and the baker last week. We just put the wings on. Uh, and so this is kind of the third week in the series. Um, and yeah, we're just going to tie the candle maker. It's a pretty straightforward fly. So I think we'll be able to tie the entire thing in one sitting. Um, so yeah, let's get started. I've, I've done a little bit of feather prep and uh, material prep um, behind the scenes uh, because it is a little bit, it's a feather heavy, uh, it's a feather wing, uh, salmon fly, it's got um, five or six uh, golden pheasant crests and then four jungle cockeyes, two on each side. And so uh, I went and picked out all my jungle cock um, and I picked out all my crests uh, just to be uh, prepared. So there's a little bit of prep that you guys ha haven't seen in the background, um, but uh, <clears throat> It's a little bit slow getting started, so I don't have my hook already set up. Um, let me just grab. Um, so many of you will notice that I uh, do pad the jaws my vice while tying with these hooks, and I do it. Uh, to protect the finish on the hooks. Um, but it doesn't need to be anything particularly special. Um, mostly what you want is a essentially a glossy, something that is highly polished. Uh, so if you, in theory, if you polish the inside, no, I didn't ask for Siri. I said in theory. Darn iPhones. Um, in theory, uh, if you if you mirror and polish the inside of your the jaws of your vice, um, you can get away with uh, uh, just using your vice jaws as is, uh, and not damaging the finish of even brightly polished hooks. Now I'm using Gaelic Supreme, Harrison Burley hooks. These are not like the most highly finished hooks out there. Um, it also depends on a lot on what the actual finish of the hook is. So for example, if it's using like a, a fairly thick baked on lacquer, um, no matter how highly polished your uh, vice jaws are, you can still damage the finish because you can, you know, crush it. Um, so using uh, the lightest amount of pressure on the on the hook possible um, while that's clamped in your vice, and also um, having something that's highly polished next to the the finished surface uh, will avoid marring the, sur the, the finish as much as possible. Um, like I said, these are Gaelic Supreme hooks. They're not the most highly finished hooks uh, out there. Um, so it's not quite as big of an imperative for me to protect it. Uh, I just think um, by using a little bit of like a, you know, you could use a piece of leather, although that's not highly polished. I'm doing, so I use a business card because my business cards are highly polished or a very smooth and glossy surface. Um, and I just use it because it pads the jaws, it puts a glossy surface next to the hook. Um, and it allows me to use a little less pressure because of the extra sponge or give that the paper um, provides. So that, Uh, I've been seeing really some really uh, fantastic hooks um, on the internet that have been, you know, mirror polished and then uh, using like gun blue 
um, blued using uh, yeah, gun blue or rust blued or uh, cold cold blued, and uh, they're they're fantastic. And you know they would be perfect for um, tying with uh, you know mirrored mirrored polished vice jaws and and, and no other. Um, And no other padding. I'll bring my trash can over. Uh, just a reminder, uh, over on my Instagram, at justwondering.brad, I'm going to be running a giveaway when I reach 500 followers. Um, I've noticed recently in the last couple of weeks that the, uh, the intake of new followers has kind of slowed down. Uh, so I'm right about 100 or 450 right now. But like I said, when I reach 500, I'll be doing a giveaway uh, of a bunch of uh, fishing quality Maryovis Marbury flies and salmon flies. Excuse me, that was not the best look. But uh, one thing I did prep beforehand was my gut for the eye. I'm just gonna tie that on. This is just, uh, again, this is just two ply twisted gut um it comes from or it's made of japanese a japanese silk fly fishing line um 15 pound test i believe a little trim flex of my thread So yeah, just my standard two-ply um, twisted gut. Unfortunately, this is the last of it. Not this piece, but I'm down to my last couple of inches. So I'm going to be looking for a new source of gut for the, uh, for the eyes soon. And unfortunately, silk gut fly line is not something you can find in your uh, neighborhood Orvis store anymore so all right just going to whip that off because we'll come back to this thread later uh, so now the, the candle maker um, has a floss portion of the body and a dubbed portion. So I'm gonna lay down a fairly good um, underbody. This is a one-out hook, so um, it doesn't need, you know, to be proportionate, it doesn't need to have a whole lot of underbody, um, but it should have a, a, some amount. Uh, and again, I'm just using my unistretch I'm going to lay down, I think, probably three layers. Um, this is not something I'd normally show on the stream. Uh, I didn't realize laying down underbody is probably not one of the more interesting things that we do. Um, it's just I did not have this hook prepped because this this week's been a little bit uh, a little bit stressful, a little bit. Um, A little bit busy, a little bit busier than normal, uh, certainly considering recent events. Um, it's the first week of online classes for my uh, master's program. So, you know, all the stress of a uh, new week of classes, plus, you know, the fact that they're online now. Or I, I've always been an online student for my master's, um, but I'm pretty sure one of these classes has never previously been offered online. So <laughs> just trying to, having the professor trying to figure out the technology was uh, interesting. Um, and then also, uh, I've been um, volunteering at the local health department uh, for the COVID-19 response. So uh, that's, that's been slightly anxiety inducing as well, but it's been a, 
it was it's been a good experience and um it's very been interesting to see how that's all being worked out by local uh health departments uh we're doing pretty well here uh, i live in the dc portion or dc region or area of northern virginia and uh, we're doing all right um here well, with the number of cases and and such um and now across the river in dc they're not they're not doing quite so well but i think that's because everybody in dc is considered essential <laughs> so they all have still have to go to work and so uh, quite a few cases Just laying down the underbody. And like I said, this has part of it is um, uh, floss. And so I definitely want to lay down a very nice and smooth underbody, uh, not just, you know, well tapered. Um, the pattern officially doesn't call for a tipper tag, but I am going to add a tag of uh, yeah, silver. Um, Uh, silver tinsel uh, because I've seen it tied that way and I liked that. I happen to like that, uh, just that version that I'd seen. So, um, although I may stop briefly here and consult some reference photos um, of other versions because I know that the, the recipe technically doesn't call for a tipper tag. I've seen it that I've seen it that way, and I like it that way. So I'm, that's why I'm going to tie it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the nice thing about fly tying is, you know, the patterns are are largely their suggestions. Um, even if you look at like Lacker's work, you know, first his first and second work, um, I think what the art of fly making, and then the art of salmon fishing or something like that, or salmon fishing. I don't have the I don't have his other work. I only have the art of fly making. So, but if you look at his his patterns, um, even like when he makes suggestions for the river ban, <clears throat> um, from the first and second book, you know he offers six patterns in each book for the river ban, but they're different patterns by and large from between the two books, which is one interesting just because they're different patterns. Um, but two, to note that, you know, they're, they're very close. Some of them are very close and similar, and some of them are completely different. So, um, and even in, even within uh, the works, oftentimes there are variations that are suggested. Um, Blacker at one point talks about a fly, <coughs> excuse me, with a, an orange body and he says, well, if the fish aren't biting on this, tie it with a pale blue body, and then they'll surely bite. Um, I like his enthusiasm, but it's just interesting to note that uh, he, even within the book, he encourages variation on his own patterns. All right, so this is the third layer. And by layer, I mean down and back. So that's one layer which is actually two layers of thread, but it's one one pass, I guess. So this is my third pass on the underbody. And every time I take a pass, I stop a little bit shorter. So like the first pass went all the way down to the end of where I'm going to tie, tie in the tag. The second pass stopped one thread width. So I'm tying this thread in flat, so it's actually fairly wide width, but one thread width short of that. And the third one is ending right at the end of the body taper. Um, then I'll take it all the way back to the front. And that'll be the underbody.
constantly tying in flat. So the key to tying in anything flat or smoothly, um, no matter what kind of fly you're tying, uh, it could be a, you know, a Bergman wet, Carrie Stevens streamer, uh, cat skill style dry fly. If you want your body to be flat and without lumps, you should always tie with flat thread. So we will put finish it off. It doesn't matter how fine your thread is or um, how small the fly or how large the fly you're tying, flat, th flat thread, flat tying thread will always go on smoother than, than twisted around tying thread. So yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty smooth uh, underbody right out of the gate. Um, at this point, I could polish or burnish the underbody itself. I don't think that's necessary. Um, the Because I'm using a coarser French silk for the body, um, there's going to be some texture to it no matter how much I polish it. So uh, it's not such a big deal to, uh, to have a little bit of texture here. Again, um, to find where the tag should end and the body should begin, I use my uh, bobbin, my thread bobbin as like a plumb bob, and I find the point at which the tie the thread crosses the point of the hook, and that's where I'm going to tie it in to start. But that's also the boundary between the tag and the body itself. Or I should say, that is traditionally. Well, I don't know if that's even traditional. I would say that's probably the modern aesthetic for where the tip and tag end and the body begins. Um, I've, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true on you know, historical flies. So you should probably watch what I say there. <laughs> but. Uh, the modern modern aesthetic is for the tip and the tag to transition to the body right at the level of the hook point. Now, like I said, um, I'm going to do a tag of yellow, or not yellow, um, tag of silver. And I'm going to use a fine flat silver. Uh, actually... I think I have it out. Where'd it go? Hmm. Interesting. I don't know where that went. You'll have to believe me when I tell you that I have some very fine flat silver tinsel. However, I won't be using it on this fly because I can't freaking find it. So, man. I have some very fine flat embossed silver tinsel. However, that's that's less ideal in this application because um, I really want something kind of bright on the end for the tag. Uh, so I think what I'm going to use end up using is this um, extra fine round and uh, curses. All right, I'll have to find that letter. Anyway, uh, this extra fine round will, will, will be fine. It'll just look be a little bit, not quite as bright, maybe a little frosty looking, but that's okay.
cut off quite a bit because the tag on this tag on this fly is actually a little bit long. Uh, this these Gaelic Supreme hooks because of where the bend starts versus where the um, tip the tip of the versus where the barb and the, the tip of the hook or the point of the hook are. Um, tend to have fairly long tags, tips and tags, but that's okay. forward, get it out of the way, as usual. First turn, is always, first turn using tinsel on a tip or a tag is always over bear shank. That way you automatically get a little bit of a taper and you also hide all the thread underneath. I also need an extra light for this because I can't quite see. <laughs> this is really fine tinsel. So I do apologize if it's a little bit washed out for a few seconds. Here while I wrap this. Use my hackle pliers just to get as much length out of it because I might not have got quite enough off the spool. Because this is super fine tinsel and this is a really long tag to be doing with super fine extra or extra fine tinsel. <laughs> So that's about as much as I'm going to get out of it, which is fine, because I actually end up pretty close to where I wanted it to be. And that actually looks pretty great. Like that. It's a little bit, that's a lot of tinsel to use, or extra fine tinsel to use on a tag like that. So I probably won't be doing that very often. But I think that actually looks rather nice. Um, it's quite sparkly, and it's quite, uh, it's almost got like that disco ball kind of look, which is, um, but it's like slightly antique, tin, antique silver, so it's like an antique dis dis disco ball look. That's not bad. <laughs> okay, so the tail on this is red ibis and um, barred, uh, uh, sorry, barred wood duck. Now I'm going to be using a uh, gray parrot. Uh, I believe these are tail feathers. Um, and then I have some barred wood duck, uh, as usual. Uh, gray parrot uh, is a pretty good color match for scarlet ibis. Uh, but unlike Scar scarlet ibis, it's a lot more uh, attainable, a lot more readily available. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's just parrot, so it ties in pretty well. Um, and actually, this stuff's pretty good for marrying. Although, as you can see, it's not the longest fibers um, out there. So 
not usually good for use in the Merry Wing. It could be substituted for um, like Scarlet, uh, Scarlet Macaw in like a side, but probably not as horns unless you're tying a fairly small size uh, hook. So, um, does not say that these are married together and, and given that the rest of the, you know, Francis Francis type flies generally are tied with mixed wings anyway, um, I'm gonna tie in the, uh, the uh, ibis or rather the gray parrot and the wood ducks separately. You know, just like any other tail component that comes in slips, you want to put two back to back, back to back. Um, kind of limited my selection of gray parrot, even. So one slip is a little bit longer than the other, but that's not too bad as long as they're the same height, same thickness. Turn that in here. Soft loop, let it fall. Let the weight of the bobbin crush the parrot. <coughs> okay. And barred wood duck. I, I, <clears throat> I don't need very, very long or very, uh, thick pieces. So I'm just going to cut a couple because this is pretty striking and it'll stand out uh, on the uh, against the parrot. I'm just going to tie one on each side of parrot slips. And at this point, because there is no butt, I'm very disappointed that there's no pearl butt. And I suppose I could add one in, but I'm not going to because the recipe doesn't call for it. I'm actually going to tie in my rib now <clears throat> before binding down the butts of everything. Because then I can make one smooth pass to the for front. <clears throat> and um, that way, uh, the underbody will be as smooth as possible under the silk portion of the body. So the rib is calls for broad silver tinsel. Uh, because this is a one-off fly, I'm using medium, medium silver flat, um, which is still pretty, pretty broad for this size fly. And I'm going to tie it in full length on the back. Again, I'm tie, I, I tie things on, if there's no butt, I will tie things on full length so that the tag end or the butt end of that piece of material is, doesn't, there's no step or bump where you cut it off. Um, and, and these tag ends for the, the tail they're a little bit short because the material that I have is a little bit short, but they are actually ending just about where I'd want the, the floss to end or floss to end anyway. So that's, there won't be that much of a step there. There might be a little bit of a step, but that's not terrible.
Now, um, <clears throat> the recipe calls for approximately one half to maybe two thirds of the body be black silk, and then there's black uh, black dubbing. It calls for pig's wool, like many of Francis Francis' uh, patterns, but I'm going to use black seal um, because I actually don't have any black pig's wool. I do not believe. At the time, that was not one of the colors in Bill Bailey's Pink's Wolf set. I believe it's still not one of the colors, but I could be wrong. I'm sure if, uh, I don't know if Bill watches these things, or these videos, but if, if he does, I'm sure he'll chime in in the comments. Um, that's approximately half, right? Just gonna eyeball it. That's cool. And oh, gonna need this later. Just, um, I have. I think I have a piece of black silk already cut. That's long enough. Now there is a hackle and it is a golden olive hackle. And unfortunately the hackle that I have is not quite the right shade of golden olive that are not quite as olive as I wanted. Um, I think what this is, this is more gold than olive. Uh, what I think it was is somebody took a very light olive hackle and over dyed it with yellow, but the yellow came out a lot stronger than they wanted it to. <clears throat> um, that's fine. You'll also note that this is a schloppen feather, which I don't normally tie with, but this is the only golden olive that I have. Um, this is the least webby of the uh, schloppen feathers out of the package. So that's fine. Um, but let me see, do I have black silk that is long enough? I think I do. And uh, I've just got one of my business cards that I've chopped up with uh, notches for holding silks. I think this little bit here should be... Uh, I don't actually need that much silk. I just need to be able to cover about half. Um, I think this is already just one ply. Excellent. Tied in, couple, couple wraps. <clears throat> now I'm gonna prepare my uh, feather, my uh, um, hackle feather, my body hackle. Uh, now because I'm actually gonna use the tying silk to tie it in. <clears throat> so I want the 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 hackle feather to be tied in. Uh, approximately a little less than a quarter of the way down the body. Um, and because that falls within the silk portion of the body, uh, that means I, I'd have to tie it in. And if I were to tie it in with a thread, um, that's not always optimal because, uh, you know, then you have to try and tie your silk around it. Um, one of the tricks that you can use is actually to use your, <coughs> your, your silk for the body to tie in your hackle. Uh, and you tie it in using, using the silk just like you would tie in using thread. Um, it's just, I'm going to tie it in as I wind the silk back towards the front. Um, it can be a little bit tricky uh, because the silk is a little bit slippery. <coughs> Um, it can be easier for the hackle to pull out from the tie-in point, but, um, in general, I found that this works pretty well. So we're going to do that today. And, you know, this flies, this flies going to headed for a frame. 
So it's unlikely to see fish, uh, which definitely makes it, um, you know, we don't need to secure everything with, you know, double the wraps and, uh, and, and all that. So. So I'm going to take the silk back down approximately. So it's approximately where I would say the second turn of rib would be. I'm just going to use my hack pliers to apply some tension to the silk so it doesn't unwind. <clears throat> going to tie in my hackle uh, kind of towards the bottom rear. I'm just going to keep winding the body silk right over it. It has been super dry here lately, so I've been getting a little bit of a frog in my throat, so uh, I apologize. Anyway, there we go. That is the silk portion. Tie it out. Tie it down. A couple of wraps. Trim it. <coughs> so, it's that. Next, I'm going to finish wrapping and tying down all these loose ends uh, with some waxed tying silk. And uh, <clears throat> like usual, I'm gonna lay down a layer of, not a complete layer, but you know, a, a few loose wraps of um, wax tying silk so that, or wax tying thread, uh, so that when I go to dub the floss portion of this, uh, the, the dubbing fibers will be trapped between wax thread, you know, that I've dubbed it around and then also wax thread uh, on the underbody as well. And, uh, waxing your thread at this point also helps bind down any kind of fuzzies in the underbody that you may not want to go through. thread again and then I'm going to start dubbing. I'm just twisting the dubbing around the thread. Um, seal you have to be a little bit of a little bit persistent with because seal is so coarse it can sometimes resist being twisted around the, the thread. Do this in a couple of steps, like usual. And if you really want to secure the dubbing fibers, you can always 
press them into the wax thread that we wrapped over the underbody. <clears throat> and actually uh, securing these dubbing fibers pretty tightly will be important because the recipe actually does call for the dubbing to be picked out towards the shoulder. And although <clears throat> you just got to remember that we need to leave enough space towards the head for a pearl head, even though the recipe doesn't call for it, because I've tied the, the butcher and the baker with hurl heads, I'm of course going to tie the candlestick maker with a hurl head. Um, we also have to leave room for a bit of a shoulder hackle. Is the dubbed portion. And it's okay if it's a little bit bushy because it does say uh, in the recipe that it should be picked out um, at the end. So now I'm going to wind my ribbing. Just want to make sure that I don't catch my hackle in that first turn of rib. And then I want my second turn to go right in front of where I tied in the hackle. Third turn, just cross where the dubbing starts. Fourth turn and then the fifth turn should occur just at the front end of the dubbing. Space that out just a little bit longer. I've heard some like visual design theory in fly time that says, and I've heard it kind of both ways, but like as you approach, as you wrap your your rib material towards the head of the fly, you should either space your ribs closer together or further apart. Um, I think I think that might be a little overthinking it, but <clears throat> I'm sure somebody will comment in below. I think it ought to be in All right, let's wrap the hackle. Hackle should just follow the rib as close as possible. Just folding it as I go.
Alright, I'm going to tie it off underneath the fly at the front. A couple turns. Like I said, not the most all over of golden olive apples, but it's nice nonetheless. <clears throat> Alright, so the shoulder hackle is a claret hackle. And As usual, I'm looking for a hackle which has barbs that are approximately the same length as the longest here, and which doesn't taper all that much, because because this is a shoulder hackle and not wound down the body, <clears throat> it doesn't have to have a whole lot of taper. I like it in this one. This fibers might be a little bit long. That's okay. <clears throat> I only need a few turns of this. As usual, tell me tie this in and keep it from slipping out while I'm tying. I'm going to wax my thread. Couple turns, tie it in. the hackle on the fly just by I'm holding the hackle up and I'm just pulling um, so I'm holding the hackle up 90 degrees to the, to the hook and I'm just pulling one side of the fibers uh, on the back side of the hackle and folding it around this way um, and just gently pulling them uh, perpendicular to the hook or to the stem rather of the hackle Take, take three turns. Um, two turns of thread. As you can see, as I pass the, th the thread through the, the hackle, I, I wiggle it back side to side just to avoid trapping any hackle fibers under the thread I'm using to tie it down. Trim a few extras. Bind it down. And at this point, it's okay if you build up a little extra bulk near the wing tie-in point. Because this is a fly utilizing whole feathers for the wing, um, just like as if I were tying in a golden pheasant tippet underwing, <clears throat> I need a little extra bulk here at the wing tie-in point to overcome the, the thickness of the stem of the hackle. Uh, so if you think, as you wrap the hackle around the shank, um, that hackle, the, the stem itself is almost like a little ledge or bump 
that you're adding on to so the, the wing tie-in point. And because <clears throat> the way you tie in whole feathers, um, you know, if you were, or even just, you know, slip wings. So if you're doing like a turkey slip wing or a, or a mallard wing, um, if you were to tie in a slip or a, a whole feather, <clears throat> and then you bind it all the way down to the point where you tied in, tied off the hackle, because of that extra the thickness of the hackle stem, that slip would be pushed upward like this. And what we want that the, the feather or slips to do is lie closely along the top of the body. Um, so by tying in a little extra bulk right there, what we're doing is we're essentially providing the, the, the wing, an underwing and the wing, a ramp over the stem of the hat. So <clears throat> with that, I'm going to whip finish off my white tying thread and switch to black. We have two bobbins in play, so we have to switch this one. <coughs> and then um, this is Legarden, uh, Legarden brand ultra fine black thread. Um, I think it's 74 denier. Uh, but you could use, you know, black unit, uh, black uh, ultra thread or you know, the 70 denier ultra thread. There you go. All right, start our black thread. Now, the wing, I've seen this tied a couple of different ways. The wing um, calls for five or six golden pheasant crusts and four uh, jungle cock eyes. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and I've seen this tied a couple of different ways. I've seen the this with tied with the jungle cock um, tied as a as an underwing. So the four two pairs of back to back jungle cock tied in as an underwing, and then like four or five crests tied over. Um, however, the recipe calls for five or six hoppings with doubled jungle cock on either side. So it, it almost by description is describing the jungle cock as being tied in as a side rather than as an underwing. So what I've decided to do, because um, I had a bit of a think about this, um, is to tie in essentially four, four of the five golden pheasant crusts I'm going to use as a wing and then tie on the jungle cock, two pairs of jungle cock as sides. And I'm gonna tie the fifth uh, crest over top of everything as like a topping. So yeah, so that's what I'm gonna do. Let me just pick out the crests. I think I need that as a tail eventually. Well, that's, that's a tail. So I have a whole selection of crests that I've pre-picked. Um, and I'm gonna tie them in, in pairs, side-by-side -side pairs. And the reason why I'm gonna do that is because of the way the stems or the, the rachises, or rachi, rachises, rachises, 
will tie in. Um, even if they end up cascading as like one, two, three, four, five, right? I'm still going to tie them in as side by side pairs <clears throat> just to distribute the bulk of the tie in points um, on the hook shank. So. First one should go up here. And I'm going to tie these in like as if I were doing, you know, normal crest work or um, like a normal underwing. So I'm going to give them a little bit of a, I'm going to flatten them right at the tying point give them a little bit of a crimp and I'm going to give them a slight twist. So the far, the ones that I'm going to tie far side or towards the camera are going to twist away from me. And then the ones that I'm going to tie in on the near side or closest to me, I'm going to give it a twist towards me. And that way, when I tie them in side by side, even though it's going on a round shank, um, if I were to tie, try and tie them in flat with, you know, the flattened portions being flat, as soon as I tied them in, they go like this. And then you'd see the wing go like that. So if I give the um, stems a slight twist as I flatten them, as I tie them in, they'll go like this. And but because they're twisted, the the crest will remain standing up straight. And because there are so many crests in the wing, I don't have to be terribly precise about how long they are, just as long as they aren't longer than I want the overall wing. And in fact, if they're staggered a little bit, that'll help fill out the wing a little bit. So here are two, I'm going to tie in side by side. I've given them opposing twists at the tie in points. As you can see, as I hold them this way, they, they want to cross because of the, the opposing twists. But when I tie them in, should even themselves out. That's right. So that's one pair. Between each pair, um, Between each pair, I'm going to wax my thread and bind down the butt ends. Because as I as I tie on each layer, I don't want them to go anywhere. Um, I might need to give those a little bit more of a twist at the tie-in point. I do want to just separate just ever so slightly. So again, the one that I'm tying closest to me, I'm giving a twist towards me. And the one that I'm tying away from me, I'm giving a twist away from me. And the nice thing about using the stem, you can use the stems as like steering levers to manipulate the, uh, or position the, the crests. So that is the first pair. Give one more tie down a wax thread. 
back to the tie-in point. I actually think maybe I got the end of their sides mixed up. Because they've got slight different curves. I want. These are shaped crests. And if you've ever heard me talk about shaped crests, you know I'm not such a huge fan of their use. A little bit fiddly because crests get to be kind of thin if you can't tie them in right during the webbing at the base of the feather. Here I wasn't able to quite. That took a little bit, but that's that's one pair. Like I said, crests can be a little bit fiddly, just because of how thin they are compared to like a tippet. So here's the next pair. these two directly on top of the previous two. Them might have been tied in a little bit long. So, let's see. Oh, this one. This bottom one's just a little bit longer than I want to be. It's not quite, it's a little bit, it's still a little bit too long to fit in the wing, so I'm going to shorten it a little bit.
If anybody wants to know why I don't often use more than three crests on wing, this is it. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think the problem is, is that these both got kinked in the same direction. Here we go. All right up on top of the wing, or on top of the body. That's my thread. Find on the butt ends. Going to pull the crest up so that I'm not laying completely down along the top of the body. Great, so now onto the jungle cock pairs. And um, just to store the pairs, I taped them to this post a note. Um, I'm going to tie in. Both feathers for one side, uh, and then I'll tie in both feathers for the other. Reverse my thread, tie in this for both feathers for the other side. Tying these in as sides and not as as underwings. So the same procedure as I would for any side would goes, which means I'm going to tie in it. Tie. It, I'm going to strip off the excess fibers. As you can see, these are here are two of them stacked up on top of each other. I'm going to tie out, strip off the extra fibers, but then I'm going to tie them in on top of the fiber, a few of the fibers remaining right at the base, and that'll help them from keep them from twisting in the wrong direction. I'm trimming, and I'm tying them in along the side of the hook and not on, on the top. Bind down the butt ends. I'm going to reverse my thread. So by tucking the thread between the end of the blind eye and the gut eye. First the thread, bring it back up to the tying point. Pair other side.
right here. Just tie them both in at the same time. Reverse my thread again, back to the way it was. I'm going to tie in one more crest on top of everything, just to cap it all off and make it a little bit tidy. this one in just like any other crest maximum thread for still need it on right along the top using wax thread just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere as soon as I got it right where I want it. The whole wing can be picked up up the body just a little bit. thread down to the half point. Just gonna give everything a pinch just so everything sets. So I could lack of the head, but of course I'm going to give it a curl head because I like curl heads.
right, so that's a really nice swirl head. Um, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to wax my thread. Again, wax thread helps bind down all of the extra kind of fuzzy bits that might be sticking out and would ruin your lacquer. Pull the hurl back. Just give it a layer of wax thread right in front of the hurl. to whip finish my black thread. All right. There we go. That is the candlestick maker. And along with the butcher, the baker. Now, the candlestick maker. So, Three men in a tub, that is the three men in a tub or nursery rhyme trio. Um, so, yeah, need some extra hands here. And uh, complete, these will be going probably in a frame or, or something and uh, it'll then they'll go up on Etsy um, all together. And uh, yeah, so those are the the, the, the uh, three men and tub trio complete. And uh, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching. Um, if you like, click the thumbs up. Uh, subscribe if you want to no be notified of when I'm going live next. Uh, it's usually on the weekends. It's usually on a Saturday, um, but it'll always be at the same time, 1 p.m. Unless I have to go live during the week, uh, then it might be a little bit later in the day. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to see more of my work, you can check out my Instagram at justwondering.brad. Uh, and if you want to support the channel, um, or purchase any of the flies you've seen me tie, uh, head on over to my Etsy shop. Uh, it's studio one, two, one, three on Etsy. Um, purchasing a fly there is the, the best way to support the channel. Um, right now it's the only way to support the channel. All of the money that uh, comes in from the Etsy shop, goes back into uh, improving the stream and improving the channel. Uh, right now, my goals for the channel are to uh, introduce, um, you know, video editing and some more kind of tighter uh, pre-recorded videos, so not just the live streams, um, so that I can do, you know, in-depth how-tos or so that I can, you know, get better angles on, on the way I do things. Uh, so to do that, um, really, I need two parts. I need a better computer because I'm right now I'm just streaming off a, a stock laptop that I think I purchased back in 2013, maybe. So it's a very old computer. Um, I'm very surprised that it does okay streaming. Um, and then the other thing that I, I, I'd like to get are a number of webcams that I can put on flexible arms and position around the tying space. Uh, so that, um, ooh, I forgot, sorry, that light's still on. I guess you can't see very well. Um, that I can position around the tying space so that, uh, you know, um, you can see different angles of how I tie things in, uh, how I do different things. So um, those two things, and the a, a higher end computer for video editing and then some webcams, uh, that I can position around the, the tying space would be great. Um, so again, all the support through Mazzy Shop goes straight back into improving the channel. Like I said, this is my hobby. Um, I don't make money off doing this. Uh, I intend not to. Uh, I just want the hobby to be self-sustaining and I wanna be able to share it with all of you. So any, any little bit of support helps. Um, I've mentioned this before, but I can't thank the people who bought stuff off my Etsy shop recently enough because I'm, I was able to purchase a very nice microphone here. 
um, and uh, hopefully improve the quality of sound. But if nothing else, I've gotten rid of the headphones. They're right there, actually. Um, gotten rid of the headphones, so it's not quite so messy uh, in, this, in this tying space. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks to everyone for their support. Thanks for watching and hanging out. I hope everybody is staying safe and staying healthy, especially these days. And uh, I'll see you next time.